Derek Arden and welcome to the Negotiators interview series. Today I'm with Justin Urquhart Stewart, who's an old friend of mine and uh, set up in uh, Seven Investment Management. Justin, welcome. Thank you very That's much fun. indeed for uh, joining me. Anytime, Derek. Justin, in the old days when we uh, both worked for Barclays, didn't we? I'm not sure we're supposed to mention that. You remember those <laughs> days? Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, Barclays sent you to Uganda and you had a really tough negotiation out there one yeah. day. Thank you for that. <laughs> I always like to be reminded of that. <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, one thing you have to do when you worked in Uganda in those days, A, you didn't wear any rings, right? Right. And it's a very, very good idea not to take an expensive watch with you. Right. Because my last negotiating tool left me was actually my watch. Really? Because uh, I had a slight technical hitch one night. Um, there had been a coup, as there was regularly, every month, seemingly. Uh, and we were driving home one night, and they, they moved the roadblocks, uh, as they do. Um, and uh, roadblocks don't consist of red and white striped poles and gentlemen with a heat cap. It's three blokes sitting in a hedge. And uh, so uh, we drove past, and of course we didn't actually know where they were anymore. So we ended up being, being shot up. Uh, one of my last ploys was to actually establish what was going to be happening next, um, was as we were lying there in not a very good state. So you were lying on the floor? Yes, um, because oh. I'd, uh, something <laughs> rather bad had happened to my, my face and back and, uh, and, oh, uh, and legs. And my face, I looked like a donut in those days, you can see what's happened to my face now. Right. But um, no, my uh, leg had virtually come off when they had, um, but uh, these chaps with the guns were coming up and uh, were terrified and we were trying to get them, my colleague who was with me, who's also rather badly shot up, could they actually get us to uh, the headquarters so we could actually try and get some help. And they weren't interested in that. So what do we actually have to try and negotiate with? The answer was, well, a watch. Right. And uh, uh, to my uh, complete embarrassment, it's, not a, it's very difficult when actually someone turns around and looks at your watch. And even in those circumstances, realise it's such an awful watch that it's not going to take you anywhere uh, because they've actually turned your watch down. So in terms of negotiation, that wasn't actually my best best position, really. Anyway, but, uh, but eventually I got to hospital. Then eventually Barclays got us out, eventually. Mm. Um, and uh, so I'm now almost in one piece. So a Rolex is a good idea. Well, have it in terms of, don't care if you don't get it nicked, <laughs> but if you needed a good negotiation ploy, but don't turn up with a rubbish watch like I had. Wow. That even gunmen don't want. <laughs> what a great story. And actually what we need to realise is we ne always need to be thinking about how we're going to negotiate because we never know what situation we're going to be in. Now turning to seven investment management, you've been hugely successful. But what was the point when you decided to go from being employed to being self-employed? Because that was a bit of a risk, wasn't it? It, well, it was a risk. And it, was, it was a moment actually of, I suppose, frustration, not to say anger, but just real annoyance. Um, uh, I was back working for Barclays again, funnily enough, they were, in those days it was Barclays stockbrokers. But the deadening hand of central uh, Barclays, and particularly the chap who was running it in those days, a chap called Bob Diamond, mm. was starting to interfere with it and getting them to try and sell products that we didn't like. Um, they were sort of structured products, complicated, expensive things. Um, and we just thought that was not right. They also changed the pricing structure. They managed to introduce an inactivity fee. Inactivity. Inactivity. So you got charged for doing something, then you get charged for doing nothing. Wow. Brilliant. Okay. And we just said, look, this is ridiculous. Yeah. This is not, we're not here to fleece clients. We're here to get clients wealthier. And it was that moment you then realised that they fundamentally did not understand the purpose of being in business. Their idea of being in business was to achieve targets, no matter what. But of course, actually, our purpose should be to help your client get wealthier. And if they get wealthier, we can get wealthier. Very simple. So I would think with that, uh, that Barclays could understand that sort of thing. But large corporations, not just Barclays, yeah. they didn't. So we set up some, primarily for ourselves. Uh, myself, my business partner, Tom Sheridan, who was also at Barclays Stockbrokers. And we looked around the market and we thought, there isn't anybody providing the right sort of service that we think is right and fair. The industry was self-serving and old-fashioned, charging commissions and other charges and anything they could just to get more money out of a club. So let's have a simple mechanism where we have one fee for the family relating to the value of the portfolio. If it goes up, we earn more. If it goes down, we earn less. Get rid of some pension charges and the ISA charges, all those little bits and pieces. Make it as simple as possible for people. And then if you can't make it, we can't make it entertaining. It's going a bit far. But you make it interesting because people don't understand about their finances, don't understand about money. So we don't teach people about that which is another big issue we'll try and manage. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we set up seven. And there was a key moment when Tom and I actually sat down with all our, remember the share option schemes and things we used to be able to get. Yeah. And we bought a box of matches and set fire them. 
Because that's that one moment. There's now no going back. You have quite literally burnt, well, not your votes, but burnt your, burnt your options. So that's it. Um, and so it was fascinating to make, make that clear decision. Um, and then to say, right, how are we going to finance it? That means more dream house again. Mm. And obviously, all those little issues, and you sit down with your family and say, look, this is going to be a few years of pain. You know, are we all happy to go along with this? And my wife was very supportive and sort of said, yeah, absolutely, come on, let's go and do it. Um, and that's what we did. And now here we are sort of 18 years later, and so far, everything's gone extremely well. So I'm that, delighted. Yeah, well done. Congratulations. That was a massive risk, though, wasn't it? It was a big house risk. on the line and yeah. all, all that. And this was revolutionary, this type of uh, um, funding at that point. At that point, it was. I mean, now a lot of what we were doing then, which was sort of very innovative, is now yeah. very standard. Yeah. But that's a classic case in business, isn't it? You know, the fact that you know, you've innovated, well, you can't stop there. You just keep on doing it. And you go in waves of having the next good idea. Then you find someone else in the industry does something else, which is quite dramatic. What are you going to do to actually make sure you can keep ahead? But keeping to those basic principles of making sure you're putting the client first in what's going on. And that may mean sometimes you're not earning as much as you thought you'd be earning, because in order to do that, we've got to do the right thing. Keeping to those principles. And it's very easy to be veered off, particularly in times of trouble, and say, well, actually, if we just charge a little bit more, no one's going to really notice, or something like that. And then you actually cross your tenants and your standards. And that way then, well, you must give up business if you're not going to do that. And of course, that's what win-win negotiating is all about and selling. You get the, get the customer what they want, and then you get what you want. Absolutely. And, it is, it, and it is, it's fascinating when you're talking to customers and prospective customers. It's not a matter of promising them anything fantastic. It's actually just explaining to them actually what should be happening mm. and how things have worked. So it's not a matter of saying, Nirvana, I've now got this wonderful magic you know, goose that lays golden eggs. No, this doesn't exist. What you can do is just get people to understand the process of what's going on, and then you win. Because they're winning because they've got some confidence as to what's going on. You're winning because on the basis you now have a cloud you can look after. And if you're doing it properly, then they'll be telling other people. It really is, as you say, win-win. Absolutely. Now, turning to where we are now, um, Brexit is moving ahead or not moving ahead, we don't know. What should the people be watching this uh, be thinking about what's going to happen about interest rates and politics and whether we will have a government with yeah. red braces or something like that? What's your take? Government at all. I mean, it is just quite astonishing. We have to bear in mind that our politics are a soap opera. Um, sometimes <laughs> they seem like a real soap opera, but you're dealing with the likes of Trump or Mrs. May and things like that. It's, it constantly carries on the entire time. But you've got to separate out politics from what happens in markets and what happens in the economy. Yes, they will affect each other. But for most investors, what they need to do is be invested in some good, solid assets which are well diversified around the world, not just in shares, but other asset classes, could be property, bonds, or commodities, and all sorts of things. And we know that you know, over time, they will behave in a certain way. There will be times when things go up and down and get a bit more volatility. Last year was the exception. We barely had any volatility. This year, we've had a little bit more, and there'll be more to come. But if you look through all of those, actually your returns, particularly with the yield, the dividend, the income you're getting on that, will compound over time to give people long-term growth. It's a long, patient game, this one. This is not about betting on the 230 at Newbury. No, that is, it's betting. And we're not trying to do betting, we're just trying to do longer term investing. And give people that vital word, trust. So they've got that trust and confidence as to what's going on. So, what should you do? No one knows what's happening with Brexit. We've got a government that can't make up its mind at the moment. So we're all very confused. We're going to end up with some form of dog's Brexit. Um, now, the economy, though, is still going all right. The concern with it is that companies are worried that, you know, unless you can tell me what's going to happen in two years' time, I'm not going to invest. I'll invest short term up to 12 months, but anything after that, no, until you can give me some clear idea of what's going on. So that's a frustration, and that's gonna, that will start being a drag on the British economy. Meanwhile, other elements are still going well. The Eurozone economy has been picking up really rather well, dominated, of course, by Germany, but other countries are improving. Even Greece is seeing some growth um, you know, from a very low level, but nonetheless, you've seen some improvement. The American economy, not because of Donald Trump, the American economy has been doing very well. Um, and so that's been recovering from the crash of, what, a decade ago. Mm. So a lot of that actually was down to the Obama period and um, seeing that growth and develop. That will, in due course, turn over and you'll see a slowdown, maybe a recession, but that could be 19, 8, uh, 2019, 2020. But that's part of the cycle. That's actually, in many ways, more encouraging that we go back to those cycles. 
China is having a bigger impact on the rest of the world, not as a renegade, but as part of the system. And so that's actually encouraging as well. So a whole new area of the globe, and this is a story that's been going on for two decades now, but nonetheless, China is having a greater impact on the global economy than ever before. And it's not going to be stopping. It's got risks, but it'll manage those. And even Japan which has been sluggish for the past, what, three decades now, showing signs of movement and showing signs of change. So the global economy is in not bad position. And, now, and can I ask you, will geopolitical risks, the world's a bit more of a dangerous place now, will but that affect shares? In, well, in the, only when you know, the rockets start flying, when it actually starts getting really rather bad. But up until then, no. Because you look what's happened in the past few years. We've had continuing running sores of the Middle East. Has that had an impact? No, not really. Um, we've got those continuing horrors of not just Syria, but Yemen as well. We've got concern in the South China Sea and the East China Sea with China and, and Japan and the East China Sea. So all those elements. And of course, Trump behaving like a child. Uh, we have no idea. So the answer is you almost have to put those on one side. There's not much you can actually do. What you have to do is actually look at the underlying uh, actual assets, be they companies you're buying shares in, bonds, which could be government, uh, and of course other assets, uh, say property and such things, and see how they're behaving. And so what you do is very gently adjust your holdings between each of those main asset classes. And we know from a previous experience that if you've got a blend of all of those, you'll get some of T5 and 6.5%, 7% after cost, depending on the level of risk people like to take. And at 7%, you double your money every 10 years. Mm. And if you can do this for long enough... And that's still working with low interest rates. That's still working with low interest rates, absolutely. As interest rates pick up, and they will... That'll actually be a bit of a drag on the market because actually interest rates go up. That'll impact on what's happening in the bond market. As interest rates go up, people will start moving money out of equities and maybe think they can get better returns elsewhere. And so you know, this will have an effect. So what we're seeing at the moment, buoyant equity markets and buoyant bond markets, is a slightly exceptional period. So you're going to see some more volatility. Um, but for the time being at the moment, people should just hold hard. Now is not the time to panic out of it. We had some volatility a few weeks ago, and some people did panic out. That squall went through very quickly indeed. People should ignore this and actually just look straight through it the whole time. Of course, you need to take account of major issues occurring, and there are always going to be risks there. But even you look at the crash of 1987, after Big Bang in 86, actually within a year, that was actually just an anomaly. If you just stayed with it all the way through, there wouldn't have been a problem. And that's what people must continue to do. Next question. Cryptocurrencies. Should I be in Bitcoin? I get about four emails a day saying I should be there. No, if you want to go gambling, go to William Hill. You know, at least with the William Hill, you're going to get something which is you'll get a little betting note. And you'll see a horse running around in circles. And it's fun. Bitcoin, you haven't got a clue. Uh, one of my colleagues, Chris Birch, who you know very well. Chris, yeah. Chris, Chris guy. He told me that one of his taxi drivers had borrowed £3,000 to go and buy Bitcoin. And they have to say it's always one of those measures, isn't it, where the shoeshine boy gives you tips and things like that. Well, when Chris's cab driver starts uh, buying Bitcoin, th that's not the time to be buying Bitcoin, is it? And, of course, what are you dealing with? You're dealing with something that is a theory. It doesn't, it's not regulated. It's got a dreadful reputation of being involved in all sorts of really unpleasant trade. Um, so you don't touch it with the barge pole. What is more interesting is the technology behind it, this blockchain technology, which the best analogy I've got is a bit like a spider's web whereby any, you touch any part of the spider's web, all the other bits will react to it. So it's a form of control and security. So not so much like, like for, for a coin system, but if you're controlling, if you're controlling say, stock in a, in a supermarket, or you're controlling manufacturing equipment and things like that, on a blockchain mechanism, it would be complete security because you'd know exactly what was going on. So that's where that technology, I could think, could be really interesting. Bitcoin, forget it. No, it's a fashion fad, and this year's fashion fad is next year's tank tops. And you and I have got many, many collections of tank tops. So as the final question to you is, what's the funniest thing you've happened on television to you? I mean, I see you on the BBC, I see you on Sky all the time. There must have been the odd disaster, or maybe you don't but, want to tell me about that, the Well, there was, there was one, it was a few years ago, with the BBC News Channel, and they used to have people almost queuing up to go on as a sort of regular supply of guests. And there was a lady on for me, from a, a legal firm, of Sue Rabbit Run or something like that. She was a solicitor, a very nice lady. Anyway, she went on and she was going, going to talk about, about her legal issues. And up came the Aston, and the Aston has that little sign underneath. And it came up as Justin Eckert Stewart, Seven Investment Management. Oh. No, that obviously means when I go on, I'm going to be her. <laughs> so she comes off, and she was not aware of this. So, so, uh, so I go on, and I sort of rather lost interest in the interview now. 
So I do the interview, and halfway through, I did what you're not supposed to be doing, which is actually look at, look at the screen. Look at my horror. It does not say, just a look at Stuart. Nor does it say, lovely lady from Sue Gravit Run. It says, Slobodan Milosevic, ex-president of Serbia. <laughs> Um, even the director came round afterwards. He said, "Just I'm terribly sorry. It's, it's an honest mistake." I said, "Could you just make sure that doesn't go on Google, please?" I've done many things in my life, but mass murder is not one of them. Yes. <laughs> so yes, it can go horribly wrong. Justin, thanks very much indeed for your time. I know you need to go off to another interview in a minute, but uh, that's uh, Justin Erkant Stewart. I've known him a long time, and there's some big tips there for you. Uh, number one, stay well clear of Bitcoin. Number two, spread your investments all around the world. And number three, don't worry too much about some of the geopolitical issues that uh, uh, we're hearing about all the time. And, and uh, the news is there to give us bad news. Remember, we need to stick with the people that are positive. Thank you, Justin. Keep negotiating.